Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. So why is this all happening at such a rapid rate? Well, the Human Genome Project was completed in uh, 2003, and that took 13 years to map out the entire human genome. And that was a very important uh, activity because this led to massive explosion in the use of genetics and genomics in the management of all disease states uh, and understanding things such as uh, cancer. Now, in 2013, there was a major change. And what was that change? The first change that happened was that Angelina Jolie brought to the world the concept of BRCA and inherited cancer risk. Before then, patients did not realize that they could inherit cancer uh, in a large, uh, in a large uh, public forum. Now patients understood there were certain genes associated with inheriting cancer. A month later, a very important uh, Supreme Court decision came down that basically said that, um, that you could not patent a normally occurring gene. Um, before then, uh, one company basically had the lock on BRCA1 or BRCA2 BRCA genes. And basically from that point forward over the last eight or nine years, many companies uh, got into the field of uh, genetic uh, genetic and genomic uh, testing for all sorts of diseases. Now, this is coming at a very rapid uh, at a very rapid rate. To point out how rapid that is, before 2016, if you looked into the NCCN guidelines, you only saw a discussion about BRCA one and two genes in the context of hereditary and breast and ovarian cancer. And it was not until 2016 that for the first mention of family history of BRCA1 or BRCA2 should be used for screening. Over the subsequent years, well, as we'll talk about, you see more recommendations for germline testing in NCCN guidelines. Um, and uh, most recently, uh, it's that goes from uh, suggested to recommended based on the risk of an individual patient. So uh, we're very proud of the we're very proud of the fact that uh, here in Philadelphia we sponsored two international prostate cancer consensus meeting. Many of the faculty members who were participating in this course today were involved, where we got together a diffuse number of uh, of specialists in urology, radiation oncology, medical oncology, gynecology medical ethicists and patients to talk about what should the role of genetic testing be for inherited prostate cancer <clears throat> risk. And we have two JCO publications based on, uh, based on the findings at this meeting. So these are the four topics we're gonna be, uh, general topics we're gonna be covering, basic prostate cancer risk, practical consideration in genetic testing, and lastly, the very exciting role of emerging uh, 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 involvement of genetic testing in advanced prostate cancer. So just to run everybody through some very basic concepts you probably forgot about in the high school or college biology, genetics is traditionally the study of individual genes and their inheritance patterns. However, today, modern genetics really involves the study of multiple genes and inheritance through families. The genome is the entire set of genes in an organism Whereas genomics is much more complex, it refers to the analysis of many genes interacting either with each other or in the environment uh, to cause diseases such as cancer. And today when we use the term genetics and genomics, they tend to be relatively uh, translatable to each topic. Now, the use of genomics, we are completely dependent on computational biology. For example, here is the, a normal BRCA2 gene. This is just one image of a small portion of exon 11. This gene is 12 pages long of AA, TC, GA, CA, G, T, 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 and so on. If it wasn't for computers, it would be impossible for us really to discuss, to, uh, to study and understand the molecular alterations that might lead to diseases such as, as uh, prostate cancer. 
Here's kind of my take on modern tumor evaluation. We go from imaging to gross pathology to histology to the cellular level to the nuclear level. We get down to the chromosome level when it comes to karyotyping, but today we are evaluating tumors based on their DNA. We're basing that on genomic analysis more and more and more, not only for inherited genes, but somatic tumor alterations that could take place in diseases such as advanced prostate cancer. So this is one of those try to remember slides. This is one of the more critical slides we're gonna talk about. Germline mutation versus somatic mutations, a very basic concept. Germline mutations are what you inherit from your mother and father, and they are in the entire organism except for red blood cells. Every cell with DNA in it has the inherited germline mutation. A somatic mutation, I like to call it the wild west of, of, of a tumor. The germline mutation may be present in a tumor itself, but it may also have unrelated genetic alterations that can be used for targeted therapy to identify agents that might be best in, in patients with diseases such as prostate cancer. So three general areas of genetic or genomic testing we use in urology are profiling, tumor sequencing, and inherited cancer risk testing. Genomic profile is something we're familiar with. We already talked about it this morning, such as the decipher. These are proprietary molecular signatures in the tumor that may guide treatment and, and, and management. Genomic tumor sequencing can either be done by tissue or more recently, the so-called liquid biopsy of just taking a blood sample and capturing circulating tumor cells. This is a much more extensive analysis of well over 300 tumors. And again, this allows us to select targeted therapies. And traditionally, this has really been used for clinical trial uh, eligibility. The last thing in our world of prostate cancer is inherited risk testing. This is where you look for inherited mutated genes, most often by a buccal smear, sometimes by blood testing. And these inherited altered mutated genes may increase the cancer risk. And they're having a major role in going forward, uh, in particular when it comes to screening prevention and testing other relatives for uh, diseases. One last comment to make is something called deep sequencing or next generation sequencing. This can take hours to days, but when we talk about deep sequencing, we're talking about going to a large piece of DNA and sequencing that region many times over and over and over. What does this do? This minimizes the errors that you may have in a readout of a mutated gene. Uh, and some of the recreational testing you'll see online to see if, uh, you could, you're beautiful or you metabolize broccoli well. These are recreational tests that are unlikely to use deep sequencing, which is why they can be offered for a much uh, lower cost. So with that basic background, let's move now to prostate cancer and inherited risk. So most prostate cancers today are sporadic. In fact, 70 to 80%, there's no signal in the family that this is an inherited cancer. About 15 to 20% of cases, we get a suggestion there may be some familial involvement, maybe a distant relative with prostate cancer, an aunt with breast cancer, uh, a sister maybe with ovarian cancer, but you can identify a gene at this point in time. Hereditary cancers though do occur in about 15% of cases, and these are due to a, due to a single inherited mutated gene. And these are the ones that really get a lot of our attention today because this is where we can make a big difference in screening and early treatment. Now, it's important to mention that these genes do not cause cancer, but they increase the risk of developing cancer. And this is very important. So again, the mutated BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes do not cause cancer, but they are uh, allow cancer to develop, they increase the risk of cancer, uh, not only in the patient, but in their family. Uh, for example, male breast cancer is more common in men with, with known uh, uh, prostate or, or, or uh, pancreatic cancer, but in members of the family, um, you can have uh, inherited genes that increase the risk of both men and women of various cancers. 
We do genomic and germline uh, testing because we can identify potentially actionable genes. We can use these for the concept of provision medicine, but more importantly for uh, preventing or screening for at-risk cancer in the patient or other family members. This is sort of the short list of mutated genes. Now, mind you, the gene listed here are mutated genes um, that cause the cancer, not the naturally occurring genes. And you'll see most of them relate to defects in DNA repair mechanism. The HOXB13 gene is an, a, is an androgen receptor related gene that is associated with early prostate cancer, aggressive prostate cancer in many males in a given uh, family. Very important paper, a breakthrough paper by Colin uh, Pritchard back in uh, 2016, showed that germline mutations were common in metastatic prostate cancer. And his paper said about 11%, as studies have gone on, it may be as high as 20% of men who have these germline mutated genes may be uh, at risk for developing metastatic prostate cancer. So the BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations in prostate cancer, these are DNA damage response genes, the natural genes. When they're mutated, they increase the lifetime risk of cancer uh, and not increase the risk of developing cancer before age 65. Of note, BRCA1 is a more active gene in ladies uh, developing breast cancer, where BRCA2 is a little bit more active in males in the development of prostate cancer. And if you got one of these mutated genes, you are likely to have a much higher uh, Gleason score and more importantly, have poor survival uh, when you have one of these mutated genes. Here is another classic paper from Bill Isaacs at Hopkins that was also published about five or six years ago. If you look here, you could see that if you have a germline mutation in one of these DNA repair genes, you see that you tend to die 10 years earlier associated with uh, prostate cancer related deaths. So these are really important genes when they've been identified. Again, here you see the increased risk of these mutated genes across various diseases. Certainly breast cancer is a much more uh, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer are much more dependent upon the BRCA1, BRCA2 axis, but nonetheless, increased risk across all these cancers if you've got a mutated uh, BRCA or other, uh, or other gene. So one question comes up, what about localized prostate cancer? Well, relatively few men will have these mutated genes in localized prostate cancer, but the exciting news is that the progression of these men to lethal cancer looks more like metastatic disease. So not a lot of research has been done yet, but this suggests that if you find a man who has a prostate cancer, regardless of the greater stage, who has a germline mutation, aggressive treatment is probably indicated. Not locked in the guidelines yet, but certainly it's going in that, uh, that direction. Let's talk now about the practical aspects of genetic testing. So uh, as urologists, we need to be thinking more broadly. We need to be focused on more family history outside of prostate cancer, start to ask about other related cancers like breast and ovarian. Uh, our um, our uh, commercial partners have very nice questionnaires that many of us use in our practice because it helps speed up uh, determining the, uh, the family history of patients with, uh, with prostate cancer. Uh, way back in 2014, we started the first prostate cancer genetic clinic at the Jefferson and the Kimmel Cancer Center, uh, where we offer initial genetic screening to the appropriate men uh, as part of our multidisciplinary care team. I am a big believer in partnering with genetic counselors. Uh, many urologists around the United States are very comfortable ordering genetic testing and counseling men uh, concerning their genetic alterations. Uh, many of us work in uh, NCI-designated cancer centers where we have a lot of genetic counselors available. Genetic counseling is a complicated process that looks at the family history, the personal cancer features and other risk factors, but not only talks about further genetic testing in the individual, but much more importantly, uh, discusses what's called cascade testing, 
Should your brother be tested? Uh, should you have your children tested and the like? And again, a lot of this goes into it. And uh, again, at Jefferson, we're blessed to have genetic counselors uh, at our disposal, but other, uh, other groups may not be as lucky as we are to have genetic counselors. So to talk about the practical aspects, there are many prostate cancer specific genetic testing panels out there from a variety of, uh, of, of commercial uh, entities that you see here. You can see most of them have the core genes, ATM, BRCA1 and 2, CHECK, EPCAM, HOXB13, and the Lynch gene sequence, the uh, MHL1, MSH2, et cetera. Some of them have other genes uh, that, uh, that are in there that we're not exactly sure why, but nonetheless, they're in, the, in, in these prostate cancer specific panels. There are other companies out there that don't have prostate specific panels, but have what's known as, for example, one company has the MyRisk 28 gene score for a variety of cancers. But again, both of these um, commercial laboratories offer general cancer screening testing. As you can see, most of them include our commonly uh, discussed prostate cancer uh, related genes. Now, testing for germline mutations, you may get a result back that shows um, a VUS, a variant of unknown significance. This can be considered a negative test, but this is one of the reasons why I'm a big believer in having a genetic counselor. What this means is right now, when you go to the gene bank at the NIH, this gene alteration, this mutated gene may not be known to be pathogenic at this time, but this database is always, always being constantly updated. And maybe in a year or two, this may be a significant gene. Now, most of the time, the VUSs are not anything important, but it's important once you do a genetic test to monitor the gene bank. And this is something that the genetic counselors are very good at. If you get a pathogenic or likely, likely pathogenic mutation, um, this is something that really requires a deeper dive, not only into the patient, but in their, in their family members. And remember, there is not one mutated BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene. There are literally hundreds uh, and some of them almost a thousand different, very specific alterations in genes such as BRCA1 or BRCA2 that can be mutated. So it's not, there's not one mutated BRCA1 or BRCA2. There can be hundreds of different variations of these, uh, of these mutated genes. Now, this is a big concept to us in urology. Medical oncologists have been very familiar with this known as somatic tumor DNA testing. This is where you go in and you either biopsy the primary tumor or the MET or today we have access, uh, growing interest in the liquid biopsy, identifying circulating tumor cells or cell-free DNA. Uh, and again, these allow you to look at hundreds and hundreds of potentially actionable genes. Very important for us in urology because we now have multiple therapeutic approvals for late stage metastatic history resistant prostate cancer that'll be discussed earlier today, PARP inhibitors, rucaparib, olaparib, and pembrolizumab if you have specific uh, MSH high or tumor mutational burden alterations on your somatic biopsy. So here's just an example of one of the commercial labs. You could see many, many, many potentially actionable genes, tumor mutation burden, and microsatellite instability uh, if you do a somatic biopsy or a liquid biopsy looking for things such as cell-free uh, cell DNA. Very important to note that while there can be some controversy, it turns out that studies done um, by Dr. Wyatt and others up at uh, Vancouver show that matched tissue and liquid biopsy show a high concordance in patients with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. And it may be a lot easier to do a liquid biopsy on a patient than going in and doing an invasive biopsy of a lymph node or a uh, liver metastasis. So this again is a very rapidly evolving area. Lastly, in the last few minutes here, I just want to go uh, over the emerging role of genetic testing in prostate cancer, screening, actor surveillance, treatment decisions at all stages, but advanced therapeutics is what we're here to talk about today, and clearly genetic and genomic testing is becoming very, very, uh, very important. Here you see the spectrum 
of, uh, of prostate cancer. And as you move to the right and you get into metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer, you see first line, second line therapies. Our third line and fourth line therapies right now really rely very heavily on genetic testing, as we mentioned, of the PARP inhibitors or PD-1 or PD-L1, such as pembrolizumab. PARP inhibitors were approved uh, within a few weeks of, uh, of, of each other back in May of 2020 for the approval of both uh, uh, olaparib and rucaparib in advanced metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. But remember, you need genomic profiling to prescribe these genes. The DNA repair genes make proteins that repair double-stranded DNA breaks. And when these are mutated um, in the DNA repair pathway, you can get neoplastic growth. And what happens is um, as this growth goes along, something known as poly-ADP ribose polymerase or PARP enzymes back up the repair to allow cells to continue to grow, even though they have uh, altered or mutated DNA repair genes. And it was discovered that if you now use these backup genes, uh, these, uh, these backup enzymes, and you block them, you have a high likelihood of killing a cell and, um, and stopping uh, the neoplastic growth. And uh, this is known as synthetic lethality where basically uh, when you have a combination of deficiencies in multiple genes, it leads to cell death, whereas a deficiency in only one of these genes does not. And that's why the PARP inhibitor, uh, the PARP agents continue these, uh, allow these cells to continue to grow uh, in, their neoplastic, uh, in their neoplastic fashion. So rucaparib is indicated for uh, adults with deleterious BRCA mutations, either germline or somatic but they have to have been treated with androgen receptor-directed therapy or an ataxane-based chemotherapy. Again, that's why these are third and fourth line agents. Olaparib has much more specific companion diagnosis, but again, discussing germline or somatic uh, mutated uh, castrate-resistant genes. Uh, here you see just uh, an illustrative example of a next-generation sequencing, looking at a tissue biopsy, or if a tissue biopsy is unavailable for olaparib, you can do a, a germline testing uh, if you don't find the specific alteration in the, in, the tumor, uh, in the tumor itself. So somatic mutation testing in prostate cancer right now for actionable mutations, um, we use have PARP inhibitors and for mismatch repair, we do have pembrolizumab available, uh, available to us. Microsatellite instability is the Lynch syndrome um, and again, uh, DNA mismatch repair, uh, you have an agent such as pembrolizumab is now also available for patients uh, who fail therapy. But again, you need somatic uh, tumor testing for this. You can also directly evaluate these mismatch repair genes by immunohistochemistry as well, which is done at some centers. It's important to note that for advanced prostate cancer, our major organizations, including AUA, Astro, and SUO, um, suggests that you should offer a PARP inhibitor based on gene, uh, uh, gene or somatic testing of patients uh, with, uh, with, advanced, uh, with advanced disease. So to wrap up very quickly, germline uh, uh, and somatic testing are important for risk assessment. They are growing in importance for prevention. Uh, in helping us decide if the disease is aggressive or indolent, and much more importantly today for treatment uh, decisions in, uh, in, precision, uh, in precision medicine, um, as we've noted. Uh, when it comes to um, testing, germline testing of patients, uh, again, if you've got high-risk prostate cancer, uh, I suggest that you look at the NCCN guidelines that talk about germline testing for high-grade cancer, metastatic cancer, uh, cribriform cancer, uh, multiple family members with breast ovarian cancer, patients with advanced aggressive prostate cancer, even when it's localized, should be considered uh, for, uh, for germline testing. So we have rapidly evolving recommendations in this area. The most critical genes today are listed there, BRCA, Hox B13, ATM, and CHECK2. Uh, and it could be as high as 25% of patients have germline mutations with metastatic disease. Uh, if you've got high-risk cancer, they should have germline testing. Even uh, 
before they develop metastatic disease. And we're doing more and more uh, for somatic tumor testing and really relying on genetic counselors. So I appreciate everyone's attention. This is a very, very complicated field. Um, if you go to your local CVS, you'll find uh, many uh, over-the-counter uh, genetic tests that you can send away for 20 or 25 bucks. But the, the real tests are done by our commercial FDA and CLIA-approved partners to help us uh, do deep sequencing and make sure we get the most accurate result possible. So thanks very much for your attention.